And there it is, Truckee High School. As told in uh, Mold Warriors, the reason I agreed to help start the syndrome is because I believed I could help clear up some of the mystery about what had happened here. And um, to this day, not a single chronic fatigue syndrome researcher has ever responded. So it's basically just you guys who are going to know what happened. We were having um, an algal bloom at the time. And in the middle of this epidemic, I went down to the uh, beach for some fresh air. I couldn't breathe. I was just burning up, had a rash, just felt terrible, and felt that a little fresh air would do me good. And when I got to the beach, I found it covered with some strange green substance that no, I couldn't identify. Nobody there could. Uh, one person said, must be grass. Like, grass that grows overnight? That's, that's ridiculous. So uh, I walked out to the water's edge and turned around. And when I looked back, that's when the real horror showed up. Um, there had been a storm. And as the receding waves um, left a flat steps of silt, the green stuff, the mucky green stuff on the top of the silt was ugly enough, but each vertical rise of these steps was absolutely fluorescent green. It was the most wicked, fluorescent, bright, glowing thing I'd ever seen. And so I'm down there digging it with a twig, trying to figure out what it is. I guess that was probably a mistake. <laughs> but um, somebody said, well, it uh, must not be dangerous, or they would warn us. <laughs> and I said, they? They don't even know it's here. <laughs> but um, as you saw from Dr. Peterson's description, uh, there was a China flu, an Asian flu, an influenza that went through, a very powerful flu. And the flu got all the, the press, and nobody was really interested in much of anything else that was going on. The... Um, <clears throat> Truckee High School epidemic that uh, Gerald Kennedy talked about was in the teacher's lounge, just directly through that door and to the left. Now, 20% of the high school got that flu. So it wasn't just um, a flu that was confined to one particular room. When I hear chronic fatigue syndrome advocates talk about it, they, they uh, behave as if it just hit these, this one group of teachers and nobody else. So I asked Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson, the two doctors involved in this outbreak, well, if the China flu didn't make everybody sick, but it did make nine out of 10 teachers in that very room sick, why don't we look at what's in that room? Um, they decided not to. Some um, air quality experts were called, and they did look for um, chemicals and Legionella and whatever bacteria they could test for at the time. But amazingly enough, toxic mold was not yet in the literature in 1985. There was no substantiation for the idea that mold could even do anything. Gerald Kennedy made a special effort when the uh, CDC investigators were in incline to seek them out and try to get around Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson's, well, lack of the they were so focused on the virus that they really weren't much interested in anything else. And they, uh, both Gerald and his wife Janice, who were both teachers there, um, approached Gary Holmes, the CDC epidemiologist, and asked him to examine the air filters of that room to see what might be found. And the CDC obviously knew nothing about the situation, no recognition of it, because they completely uh, blew them off. As Gerald Kennedy said, he looked at us like we were loonies. He'd already made up his mind about us. So they left and had no intention of uh, following up on the uh, mystery illness. And that's why Dr. Peterson says it wasn't much of a, an outbreak. There was no serious attempt to find out what was going on. So we were left to our own devices. And because I uh, was a student at Truckee High School, I thought that I could conduct my own investigation. And I went there and started crawling around and started sniffing the carpet. And it 
damn near gave me hallucinations. Um, but still no answers and no assistance in looking into it. There was a whole row of copy machines uh, down in the room to the left. And one of the prime suspects was perhaps a synergism between the toxic fumes coming from those copy machines, maybe the particulates from the ink combining with the mold or combining with whatever happened to be going on. This was my idea that there might be mold because I was down in the carpet sniffing it. <laughs> and then in um, 1994, I'm a little out of order here. In 1994, the uh, Saratoga Springs uh, Proceedings Manual, basically the Bible for the indoor quality movement, speculated about the inception of chronic fatigue syndrome, and they actually wondered if that very room could have mold in it. And so I got all excited, and I contacted Dr. Yohani, and I told him that I was there, and I could affirm that there was indeed mold. But um, they decided not to follow up on it, strangely. I thought they, solving a syndrome was part of the plan. So we found it ourselves. Uh, local restoration consultants uh, were eventually called in. And this was before toxic mold was really recognized as a health factor. So they cleaned it up out of the kindness of their hearts to do the right thing. We're committed to finding out what the problem is. Maybe mold wasn't the issue in the first place. So they did clean it up. I have an idea that they probably knew that mold was toxic at this point because I've talked to those remediation consultants and they were very much aware of it. But still, can't, I can't diss my old school. They tried to do the right thing. But we had some uh, theories about what might be going on over the whole North Tahoe area because there were other clusters. The mold was acting up in many different places. And the fact of mold suddenly increasing its pathogenesis in a number of buildings at one time didn't seem reasonable to anybody. And yet, why did it strike the North Shore and not the South Shore? South Shore is much more populated. It seemed uh, unreasonable to me that they wouldn't look into this. And we looked around for what might be the cause. When you uh, have a major change in your environment, whatever uh, might have caused some substantial alteration in the microbial flora, it seems obvious to suspect it. And they were doing some very intense cloud seeding with silver iodide to nucleate the uh, uh, precipitation coming over the mountains and provide snow for the ski areas. And the ski areas became so aggressive about this cloud seeding that they um, actually hired private planes to dust every cloud that was coming over. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting. Particulates, ultrafine particulates. That's, this is a major change in our environment. It was happening over the, the North Tahoe area. So that, uh, that's where my interest in nanoparticles began. And in 2007, I uh, found an uh, article that mold actually processes nanoparticles. It concentrates them into clusters. Uh, we were so worried about these, this cloud seeding that we asked the environmental specialists, and they said, well, of course the cloud seeding is bad if it's uh, concentrated. If you put it in a goldfish bowl, it'll kill the fish. But because it's dispersed over a wide area, it's not a problem. But what if the mold was concentrating these nanoparticles into packets? Perhaps you could get a toxic dose. And if uh, that wasn't enough, I read an article that they're actually using nanoparticles to uh, deliver medicine into the brain that it bypasses the blood-brain barrier by literally dancing around its defenses. 
and that VOCs will actually adhere to the surface of these nanoparticles due to their high surface reactivity. And I thought, well, here we have a mechanism for why the mold could have increased its power so dramatically, how we've got a delivery system for mycotoxins and other VOCs directly into the brain, and it also agrees with the pattern I saw of the uh, mold colonies in these buildings, because each and every one seemed to be places where rainwater was concentrating. Existing mold colonies uh, seem to keep their old pathogenesis. The only ones that really seemed problematic to me were the ones from flat roof buildings where there was a leak, where it was being fed from a wide area where rainwater, something out of the atmosphere, could concentrate. So I approached researchers, chronic fatigue scene researchers, for years and years trying to explain this concept and uh, got shot down cold because, as we all know, chronic fatigue syndrome is a virus. I'd like to explain something a little about uh, nanoparticles. They're more than just something reduced down to a small size. It's actually a conceptual framework of what a nanoparticle does. They're uh, approaching a point where the density of the material involved and the vibration, the vibrational energy of the atoms has uh, so little ability to dissipate over the surface of the nanoparticle that has a, a very high charge of free surface energy. That surface energy is extremely oxidative. It's uh, highly electrostatic. And people have been wondering why I've been carrying around this piece of styrofoam. <laughs> and it's kind of like, kind of like this, uh, styrofoam is what it is. It's uh, not harmful. It's not a problem. We know how it's going to act. It, I, you throw it up in the wind, it's not going to go very far. And we know what to expect when it's this size. But have you ever dropped a box of those darn styrofoam plastic peanuts and tried to pick them up? They stick to everything. You can't get rid of them. And then you try to put them in a box, and the damn things jump right back out? <laughs> Well, that's essentially the same thing. With their, their surface energy, nanoparticles have the ability to dance right through our body's defenses, go directly into the blood and into the brain, which is why medicine thinks they're a great delivery device. There are some drawbacks to nanoparticles. Unfortunately, they are not eliminated from the body. Uh, we have no effective mechanism to detoxify from these things. Um, and whatever VOC happens to be in the air is going to glom onto that nanoparticle and be transported directly into your brain and have an antigenic presentation, which is completely unlike if you uh, simply breathe it into your lungs or put it on your skin. Obviously, the microglia are not going to be happy about anything that impacts them directly. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shoemaker and Dr. Berenson for being the first researchers to actually follow up on the chronic fatigue syndrome evidence, the original evidence, and bring some of this stuff to light. <laughs>